This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Neighborhoods built in the time of the segregated South. Neighborhoods that offered Charlotte's African-American community opportunity. Everybody in the neighborhood knew each other. And everybody in the neighborhood took care of each other. Neighborhoods built around Johnson C. Smith University, which to this day provides a catalyst for opportunity. This was one place that we could go being special when we lived in a segregated world. Neighborhoods where African-American doctors, lawyers, teachers, professors, masons, nurses, housekeepers, pastors, civil rights leaders, and others called home. There's a rich history here. We're in an area that has been a, a center for uh, black cultural life, for uh, the, the intellectual community around the university for over 150 years. But change is coming. What I see happening is that people are moving into our neighborhoods and they don't know the history of the neighborhood. We should all learn to work together, live together, play together. Charlotte's historic West End, the people who call it home, the beacon on the hill that offered security, opportunity, and a pathway to success. Longtime residents and others are now working to preserve that history as the West End evolves with the times. That and more on Trail of History. So we're leaving the historic Johnson C. Smith. I'm Tom Hanchett. I'm a community historian. I've been working in Charlotte since the 1980s. On this day, Hanchett, along with John Howard, venture out into the West End. One of the most historic parts of Charlotte is the area around Johnson C. Smith University, just west of Uptown. The two often team up and offer tours of the area to different groups. And you ended up renting for generations. Howard's background is in city planning. He spent years working on Charlotte's west side. West side's got some great views. Um, it does sit kind of on a higher plane uh, than the rest of the city, so you have some really dramatic views of, of the city from, from here. And it's that view and proximity to Charlotte's thriving uptown spurring change, like an extension of the streetcar. Streetcars tend to uh, increase property values and and they also have a sense of permanence for a lot of people, developers in particular. So I think when the streetcar starts running, um, you'll see another major uh, sweep of change in terms of land use. Hanchett and Howard know progress is inevitable, but they're working to limit the impact felt by long-term residents. They want to retain the identity of these West Side neighborhoods, which is why they give these tours. Tours they hope will build bridges in a community that's proud of its history and sees a strong future. The West End we know today was once farmland, but that all started to change after the Civil War. Uh, Johnson C. Smith started out right after the Civil War as Biddle Institute, which was a, an academy to train preachers and teachers. The Presbyterian Church very much into having a, a literate ministerial core. And uh, when African Americans in slavery uh, became free, uh, they said, we need leaders, we need preachers, we need teachers. And initially, Biddle Institute taught basic literacy. Biddle Institute started in 1867 and found its permanent home in 1876. It's there because a white landowner, William R. Myers, same guy behind Myers Park, gave uh, land for a number of African-American institutions after the Civil War. In 1883, the Institute built the iconic Biddle Memorial Hall. Fast forward to the 1920s. After a generous donation, the school was renamed Johnson C. Smith University. For more than 100 years, the institution has served as a place of higher education and a catalyst for development in the African-American community. But during the uncertainty of the civil rights movement, it served as a symbol of refuge. The west side of town was both black and white. Uh, the Seversville neighborhood right near the university was a white neighborhood into the 1970s. Um, but as older neighborhoods toward the center city were demolished in quote unquote urban renewal in the 1960s, uh, African Americans got pushed out and tended to settle um, near the university because it was such a, 
a beacon of learning, a beacon of achievement. We are in Biddleville. Uh, we just passed Smallwood, and Biddleville is this part, it's kind of a uh, amalgamation of different neighborhoods. So we're across the street from, from John C. Smith University. And this is a mostly single family neighborhood, um, but there's also churches here, uh, not too much multifamily. So it's a little bit different than Wesley Heights. Uh, it's definitely much more single family. We just lost a few homes on our left and our right that were original, uh, that were torn down. But one great story is um, Foster Village over here on the right hand corner. According to Hanchett, this large brick home once belonged to JCSU's first African American professor. Today, his old home has new purpose. Very pleased to see that the Historic Landmarks Commission and Johnson C. Smith partnered a couple of years ago on renovating that building, restoring that beautiful porch. And the George E. Davis house is now Foster Village. Uh, foster kids coming out of foster care, that ends at the end of high school. And so many of them don't make it to college. And what Foster Village is, is a, a place where they can find the support they need to become part of this college community, this beacon on the hill. Back on the tour. Talk about Washington Heights. This is uh, what, what Tom calls the first and maybe only African-American streetcar suburb. Definitely the only one in Charlotte. All the other ones went to the Elizabeth, Dilworth, Myers Park neighborhoods, which are um, all white. This is the only one that was really built in and around the streetcar. It has gone through some changes. Um, it was built as a middle class black neighborhood, actually. And over the years, it has kind of gone into disrepair. Uh, it's become mostly rental up to this point. But I have seen some signs on this tour that we are seeing some um, reinvestment here, which is a very good sign. And part of that is because it has such a fierce, loving neighborhood leader. Yes, uh, Manny Marshall, who has been here fighting and pushing and in the ears of, of planners like me and leaders and mayors and council to help bring investment and help improve safety in this community. I live in, um I like to refer to it as historic Washington Heights, a neighborhood that's, um, I could say, 0.9 miles from Johnson C. Smith University and named in honor of Booker T. Washington, and it's a bungalow-style neighborhood. Maddie Marshall serves as the president of the Washington Heights Neighborhood Association. Just on the edge of her neighborhood lies another icon of Charlotte's African-American community. Washington Heights is also notable because that is the location of the Excelsior Club. The Excelsior Club was a coming together place for African American professionals. And a lot of the people who built black institutions, um, doctors, attorneys, um, uh, ministers, uh, folks like that always need a place to come together informally and talk and strategize and that's what a country club does. Well, that's what the Excelsior Club did. You know, you could let your hair down and then dance and just enjoy. Weddings were there, birthday parties we had at the Excelsior Club as well, and yes, political gatherings. You know, they would come and gather there, not only during election time, but when they wanted to feel the pulse of the community, they know where that pulse was and that where they needed to be. And so having people come together, having them um, spend time at the Excelsior Club um, was a place where, where new ideas could bubble up, where people could come together uh, ostensibly to play bridge or to hang out or listen to music, come for the fish fry, come for the dances, whatever. Um, but it's in those coming togethers that a true community is built. Before the Fair Housing Act of 1968, there was a nationwide discriminatory practice on placing deed restrictions barring the sale of a home based on the buyer's race. In Charlotte, this practice led to the creation of neighborhoods like McCrory Heights. H.L. McCrory, Reverend H.L. McCrory from uh, Johnson C. Smith created this as a neighborhood for African-American professionals, including folks like Robert H. Green. 
African American um, doctor, couldn't live in Myers Park, you know, he's well esteemed, couldn't live in, in the Dilworths of, of the world here because of deed restrictions. Uh, so he settled here um, on the west side. Many of Charlotte's civil rights leaders called the west side home. It was around the dinner table and front porches in these neighborhoods where strategy for change was discussed. Because you think of the people who lived in those neighborhoods, we talk about Dr. Reginald Hawkins, you talk about Kelly Alexander, you talk about Attorney, you talk about Attorney Bell. You know, these are the people who gathered. You talk about the uh, the Beltons or the Delanes. So you think in terms of these are the people who got together around the tables and start having these conversations. A lot of that too came from the faith community in terms of civil rights back in those days. A lot of them were right right there in. Uh, who lived on the west side. Dorothy Count Scoggins was a teenager living on the west side in the 1950s. In 1957, three years after Brown, um, there were a group of families in Charlotte led by the late Kelly Alexander, who at that time was president of the NAACP here in Charlotte. He approached my family uh, of the possibility of um, enrolling their children in a predominantly white school. Mm -hmm. I went to Harding. It was not a, I uh, went there, ended up going four days, a lot of um, harassment during that time, a lot of non-acceptance, uh, a lot of um, judging me based on the color of my skin. Uh, but I always say that my going to Harding was um, a right time for us, but it was not a right time for them. Eight years later, with racial tension still high in Charlotte, the unthinkable happened in McCrory Heights. Dr. Uh, Reginald Hawkins' house, that house was bombed in 1965. Uh, Reginald Hawkins was an African-American dentist who um, was not dependent on uh, white dollars because he served African-American customers. And so he could be a little bit more pushy and he delighted in that. He led the marches that desegregated the upscale restaurants. He led the marches that desegregated the hospital system um, and um, was one of the plaintiffs in the Swan versus Mecklenburg school busing case. Uh, November of 1965, his house and three others were bombed in the middle of the night. And nobody knows still who did it. Recently, Hanchett took on a project in McCrory Heights, capturing the stories of those who call the neighborhood home. I'm an urban historian. I'm a person who like many Southerners, feels the, the power of place. And here on the west side around Johnson C. Smith, uh, the places, some are humble, some are fine, uh, but all of those places have stories. And by focusing on Macquarie Heights, a place that is clearly special on the west side, that began to unlock stories of history makers. The Macquarie Heights neighborhood was full of very highly educated people. Most houses had not one, but two folks who had a college degree. Many houses, uh, some with a master's, a number of houses with, with doctorate degrees. 166 houses, 166 stories, and they're now on the web. Uh, if you Google McCrory Heights and HistorySouth.org, uh, you can find the history. Back at Johnson C. Smith University. My name is Brandon Lunsford. I am the university archivist and digital manager. I take care of the history of the university. Um, the, the goal was to preserve, uh, protect, and display the history of the university. And with more than 100 years in the books for JCSU, that's a lot of history. More than enough to keep Lunsford busy. But seeing a need in the greater West End community, he took the initiative to do more. Our collections are very, very focused on the history of the university, Johnson C. Smith, but as I've become archivist, my goal has been to sort of expand into the neighborhood and discover a little bit more history of the West End and the neighborhood surrounding the school. To curate and share the history and stories of the different West End neighborhoods, Lunsford launched the website westendcharlotte.org. I have no idea what's on these streets, almost down these side streets. Uh, if you went off this road, you would see these amazing neighborhoods from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, like suburban America neighborhoods that, that you honestly thought about white people living in in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. But these were middle-class black families that were, that were living here and doing well and like building a community and they all knew each other. 
The most important thing, I think, is for the people that are moving in here to realize the history that exists in this neighborhood and to realize what they're moving into and how important this place was and not to be just blindly moving into a place and not understand where they're living. So I think that's what we're trying to do with the map. It's an interactive website. When he started the project, Lunsford took advantage of the extensive James Peeler photograph collection. It's part of the Inez Moore Parker archives at JCSU. What I'm trying to do right now is recreate the built environment of the West End. So like what school was here? What church was here? What business was here? And you do that through pictures and Peeler captured everything. It's very useful. He's been amazing for me to have this at my disposal. That's what really inspired me to do this map, was that I knew we had enough pictures through his collection to get started. As we started going through, we realized there was a lot in there. I mean, way more than we had thought. We still don't know, have any idea how much is really in there, and 200, 300,000 items. All donated by Peeler's daughter, Latrell Peeler McAllister. My dad was uh, a portrait photographer that took photographs of many activities in Charlotte, North Carolina for almost 50 years. Today we are in the James B. Duke Library at Johnson C. Smith University and this room has been dedicated to sorting and digitizing the work of my father's photography collection. Peeler grew up off Beatty's Ford Road, attended Johnson C. Smith, and first learned photography while serving in the Korean War. After he returned home, he decided to go to New York Institute of Photography where he honed his craft and uh, then came back home and set up shop here along the Batesford Road Corridor here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Back in Charlotte's West End, Peeler went to work capturing moments and memories in Charlotte's African-American community. He had a variety of subjects. He did portrait photography, group photography. He did a lot of weddings, family reunions, photographs of prominent politicians in the area. To me, the most amazing thing about Peeler was that he was so diverse. The amount of things that he took pictures of was just incredible. So, I mean, he would take accident photos of people that had been in accidents. And he would take school photos. There was weddings, there was funerals, there's uh, lots of funerals, lots of weddings. He did, at one time, he did uh, school photography, and especially at the segregated schools back in the 50s and the 60s, he did photography work for them. He did a lot of photography here at Johnson C. Smith for the Director of Public Relations. So he captured photographs of our homecoming, our um, homecoming parade, the football games, the queens. Uh, he contributed to the yearbook, taking pictures of the faculty and the staff. Peeler even captured Martin Luther King Jr. during a visit to Charlotte. When he visited Charlotte, Martin Luther King, he was called on by students, primarily students at Johnson C. Smith, during the protests in the 60s to capture their efforts for the civil rights movement. For McAllister, she knows her father's work and legacy are in good hands. The archivists here have gained regional and national acclaim for their work. It was important to me that the work stayed in the community, and especially that it helped to enrich the collection of his alma mater, Johnson C. Smith. As the tour continued, Hansha and Howard discussed how the West End today is changing, the good and the not so good. Got a lot of really good things off the, off the corridor. Wesley Heights is over here to our, to our right, um, historic neighborhood nationally and locally. And it's the only one actually um, in this corridor area. So the great thing about these old neighborhoods is th there's a great mix of, of styles here. Um, you used to be able to buy a home here for, I don't know, 10, 15, $20,000, you know, back in the 80s. It's gone up substantially in, in value, which has caused some strain. Um, it's a mix. It's a mix of quadruplexes and duplexes, and you can't sometimes tell one from the other. But now those are being turned into single-family homes, so we're kind of losing that, that middle part of, of, of residential housing here. As you drive around these streets, it's clear change is coming. The proximity to Charlotte's vibrant uptown draws people to the West End. But for some, there can be trust issues. Everything that happened from urban renewal and how those government actions affected how people moved 
uh, either willfully or unwillfully uh, back in the 50s and 60s. And a lot of folks who uh, were impacted by that are still here with us. Uh, their families and descendants are still with us. Uh, the businesses that used to be downtown are now in different places or not existing anymore. So understanding um, uh, that history is very important. Still, for the longtime residents like Maddie Marshall and Dorothy Count Scoggins, there's an optimistic concern. People need to know the history and need to understand, you know, relationship building. And when I moved in in 2002 in that neighborhood, change wasn't taking place as it is now. But it has, I've seen over the last 10 years, is a constant change, and when I say change, what is happening is that a lot of the homes that were in that area are not being necessarily restored, but they're being torn down and new homes have been built. So what I see happening is that people are moving into our neighborhoods and they don't know the history of the neighborhood. And I have no problem with change, but I think what is important to me is that the history be maintained. They need to learn the history and help us to maintain the history. Because they live, they've chosen to live in a historic area. One group that's been proactive in the West End, helping not only to preserve history, but also helping the West End reimagine itself, is Charlotte Center City Partners. A lot of times when you see um, the neighborhoods change so rapidly, there's often that friction of older uh, residents and the newer residents not really having those meaningful opportunities to interact. But um, our work and the, the neighborhood leaders' work are really focused on and being intentional about creating meaningful gathering opportunities to make sure that folks know each other. They're working pretty well together. I was just at a community meeting last week and you would see a number of different residents, old and new and young, black and white, all mixed in together, working together. And that, I'd say that's a lot of, of the hard work of the neighborhood leaders over the years. They have been really intentional about being inclusive in whatever they do. And so as the area grows, that, that inclusion is extremely important. It's important socially with uh, civil rights history and fair housing and how people moved to this part of town and what got built here and how do we kind of protect what people really want to protect. So that, that's the main thing is, you know, what do people want out of what we can do instead of what we think we should do for them. So again, it's working in tandem with our neighborhoods and residents. Setting the stage for inclusive redevelopment, Mosaic Village, a mix of college student housing on top and office and retail space on the bottom. Mosaic Village is, um, is a culmination of a partnership between John C. Smith University uh, the Griffin brothers family um, and the actual architect himself who is also vested here uh, financially and Mosaic being kind of a tapestry of culture, of history that kind of, is, is kind of culminates what this area is really known for. Along with the new investments in real estate, the city has invested substantially in the West End with the streetcar extension that goes right in front of Mosaic Village further enhancing the West End's connection to Uptown. Now streetcar is coming back. Uh, we took it away back in the 30s and now we're bringing it back on trade in Beatty's Ford Road. So we're kind of repeating history in a way. As the old saying goes, nothing stays the same. Change is coming to the historic West End. But Alicia Osborne with the Charlotte Center City Partner says with balanced steps, the change can be positive. Being able to create a meaningful place for folks to live, play, and work. All that's at stake. So it's really important that whatever happens um, in terms of planning and development and place making and creating um, new things for people to, to experience that, you know, this place was great before and it will be great in the future and make sure that folks understand what their place is in that new um, experience in West End. The banners in the West End read proud history, strong future. The winds of change may be upon us, but Charlotte's historic West End is a special place, one that needs to be remembered, restored, and revitalized. The history serves to honor a community where generations thrived in the face of racism, where so many lived out their American dream. 
So as new life and new construction are infused into the daily landscape of these special neighborhoods, there is renewed desire to remember the past. Many here are determined for the world to know not just where they're going, but where they've been. It's an inherited realm of history that all of us should know and none should forget. Production of PBS Charlotte.